Hello and welcome back to the TT Podcast. This is part two of Jenny Timmuth's podcast. Jenny, we um, we left part one, just getting into the TT. We pretty much spoke about your whole career and how you got into motorcycling. But let's talk about the TT. And you, always, and you always had slow engines. <laughs> slow engines, no slow engines and no tyres. Second hand tyres. Yeah. Second hand tyres. Story of every race. Tyres from the skip. <laughs> Please tell me you didn't start the TT on on uh, old tires. No, I had new tires for that. So, <laughs> in terms of the TT, we spoke briefly about it in the in the first part about you always having aspirations and desires to go and do it when you felt ready. But it wasn't until two thousand and nine, yeah, that you you thought you were you were ready to go racing at the TT. So, how did it go from short circuits into that step into TT land? Um, I think it was because I'd done it. I'd done a year on a four stroke at that point. Um, cause it, it used to be the, the progression was a one, two fives, two fifty, two stroke, 600, but obviously they, it was kind of the area where they got rid of the two strokes. So there was no, uh, was it like with TT where they had one, two fives and two fifties, yeah. but they, that, that had gone. That'd so, gone, yeah. um, there was no chance to take the one, two five there or any progression at British championship onto two fifty. So it, it was a case of getting onto a four stroke. Um, so I'd done the year 2008 on the super sport bike and then. I thought, okay, I know how to ride a four-stroke now, so I can... You felt competent go. enough to... Yeah, I was like... Screw it, right, let's yeah, go. Yeah, I, I can get my way over there. And luckily, you know, you, you have to be a certain level to go. You know, Paul Phillips won't accept anybody over there. And luckily for me, doing British Championship bode well in terms of them letting me go across and do it, you know. And I went over 2008 to the Manx Grand Prix. Uh, they flew me over, you know, just to have a look at it and mm-hmm. get to learn all about it and talk to Milky Quail and all of the usual, usual things, so... Yeah, and then entered it for 2009. I didn't feel like you were out of your depth when you got there for the Manx then to have a look around. You knew, and how much of the course did you know by then? Had you started <laughs> doing any research? I knew none. <laughs> really? Yeah, because Milky, like, I knew obviously some iconic places, but I yeah. um, started doing laps with Milky. And he would he would say, like, do you know where you are? And I was like, am I here? And he'd go, no. <laughs> 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 and I was like, oh my God, I'm not, I don't know how I'm possibly going to remember where everything is and yeah. where I am and yeah it was a it was a, at that point I thought oh this is a this is a big job to study this you know <laughs> it's gonna yeah. take a bit longer than a couple of weeks so how many around. times did you go backwards and forwards and um, watching your pro- own boards and stuff like that yeah I probably went I think I only probably went five five times over there but um back in the days before the iPhone I was fil- I feel I still had a camera phone and I filmed everything I filmed Milky Quail you know as he was talking yeah through the lap and the description of um which grids to ride over where you want to be what gears you want to be in and which hedges to aim for and what pil- you know what lamp posts to line yourself up towards and all all the rest of it. i filmed it all because i thought there's no way i'm going to remember mm-hmm. everything he's saying um and then i went back and studied sort of what he said and i actually made myself a book of the course watched oh nice a, yeah a guy a guy martin on board lap screenshot it from the from the video printed it off put it in a book wrote down the name of the corner, what Milky said I should be doing at that corner. So I could see what the corner looked like. Yeah. Um, I knew the name in the corner for like a reference and then tried to put, piece together what Milky said, where I need to be, what sort of gear I would be in, what if it's late apex, early apex, whatever, you know, yeah. and try and then just study it. So I sort of br- ended up breaking it down sort of into three sections and it sort of naturally kind of goes into three sections, doesn't it? And I just sort of learnt it bit by bit and eventually... I think it's like if you learn a language, you're like, I'm never going to learn this. And then all of a sudden, it just all the pieces sort of yeah, fit into place. And you go, oh, okay, I think, I, I think I've got it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then first time getting there as a rider, again, I think we've, we've, the amount of people that come here and say, I did the laps with Milky, spoke to Barty, I came over and did all these laps in a car. But the moment you get on that road and it's there's no more cars there, it's, it's just you and the track. How did that feel? Did Did you feel like, all of a sudden everything that you'd learned had gone out of your head or was it all still there and you're like ah yeah now I get this no it's definitely still there I think the self-preservation makes it <laughs> be there <Yeah. laughs> um, but I think I was just so I was a bit overwhelmed by the fact that somebody actually shuts the road so that you can go for a blast <laughs> yeah. it's just yeah. this is because you know doing the after work going around for a blast on my local roads um, they were quiet roads but I was never on the wrong side of the road you know I was always on the right side of the road and always aware that I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing yeah um so for somebody to actually shut everything for you <laughs> let you go all through all the red traffic lights and let you break the speed limit and there'd be nothing else on there it's just it's like the bizarrest thing ever you think this is just this it's is not, so great that somebody's yeah. done allowing us to do this. <laughs> yeah 
Um, so yeah, it was the, like the first lap behind Milky was great, but I was so I think I was just so overwhelmed with the all of the furniture and all you know the fact that you are on a road and the fact that you can use both sides of the road and I was I was more and I was trying to remember everything that he said obviously at the same time, but I was just kind of a bit like. Starry-eyed and rabbit in the headlights at, at the same time, you know. But, but you, so, so, so you went out for your lap behind Milky, as yeah. everybody does now, which is great, fabulous. Back into the into the paddock, and then when you went out back out on your own, how yeah. was that? I think that was great as well because you, you're on your own, then aren't you? Yeah. You remembering everything that you've been it's real then. Yeah. You've got to find your own way around. With Milky, you follow you're following somebody else. You're following a train of riders. You're not. You are looking at everything and trying to remember everything, but you don't. If you do forget something, it doesn't matter because you have got somebody to follow. Mm-hmm. But when you're on your own, you've got to remember everything yourself and put into practice everything that you think you think you've learned before you've gone, you know. And um, yeah, it was great. I I loved it. I was just absolutely buzzing, you know. The fact that I was allowed to do this and I can go as fast as I wanted, and it was it was nice to see, make sure that I'd learned it. It's like, yeah, I know, I know exactly where I am. I know what I'm doing. Obviously, I didn't know how fast I could go, but I knew where I was. I knew what was coming up, and it's just it was great, you know. It's, the best feeling in the world. Everyone will tell you, won't they, that it's the best feeling in the world, and it is. Were you the same then, Steve? Because, again, I brought you in on this conversation a few times, but it sounds like you were just so competitive, you probably didn't take it in the same as Jenny. You, pro- Again, tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you would have gone there and gone, I need to know this place, I need to go and win this place, I need to get as up to speed as fast as possible, or were you a bit like rabbit in the headlights? No, uh, I mean, I think everybody is to a certain degree, because right. it doesn't matter how much preparation, I mean, I prepared massively. Um, Did you have a book? No, uh, but I wrote, I wrote lots and lots of notes, I walked right. an awful lot of corners, as well as rode them and mm-hmm. uh, in, in a car. Um, before you know, um, before my first event, before my first laps, um, I spent a lot of time driving around and going around with other other people, other riders, for advice on various different things. I just, I was lucky to have this kind of Mick Grant in my corner as well, helping out and stuff. And um, he, you know, it was and it was purely to keep me safe. Mm-hmm. And you, it wasn't particularly learning uh, every corner, just section by section, just to make sure you knew what section you were running into. Cause some of them look the same and at yeah. 150, 80 mile an hour, it's you're in a whole world of hell. Um, and then once you got over that obstacle, then it was fine tuning different areas. But to answer your question, um, I never, no, it wasn't probably subconsciously. Yeah, I wanted to win, but in my mindset wasn't to try and get the win at the TT. It was, you know, just to have a good time and yeah. see how it kind of went. And I knew it was going to be an apprenticeship to, as most people say, take three to five years to even get on the podium. But I suppose I was lucky. Well, that's it. Yeah, it takes it should take three to five years to learn it. Both of you guys only did it for 2000. Uh, did you do three years? Three you years. Did three or four years? Two. Two years, only two. 2009 and 10. Of course, yeah. Blimey now. So in terms of mentors, like Steve said, he had Mick Grant in his corner. Did Who... Did you gravitate towards when once you got there, and who did you start kind of picking things up from, apart um, from Milky and, and and Barty there? Yeah, obviously Milky was massive. Yeah. But then Paul Shoesmith, I went, I went, I did loads of laps with Paul Shoesmith. Mm-hmm. Um, he was he encouraged me to do it as well, and yeah, we did loads of laps in in the car, and he he knew everything as well. You know, he knew all yeah. the bumps and rises and where he should be and where he shouldn't be. So he was yeah, he was a great teacher. Um, Rob Barber helped me quite a bit as well. Obviously, got a few words of wisdom from McGuinness and um, people like that. So. Yeah. What one piece of advice stuck in your head forever? So, the, well, the, the one from Bar- Rob Barber was good. He was, he was on about the comfort roll. So if you're not too sure, just do a comfort roll. <laughs> As in just roll yeah. off the throttle? Just roll, never break, never do anything else. Just do a little comfort <laughs> roll and go, and go again. <laughs> and then McGuinness just said, uh, McGuinness said, if you're unsure, just stay in the middle of the road. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. I was, um, I was in a, a, a van with Hickey and he said exactly the same. They were talking to Josh. Josh had just come back, so it was just this year. And he said, if at any point you don't know what you're doing, get in the middle of the road. And he, he called it meerkatting. Just get your head up yeah. and just look at what's around you. Stay in the middle of the road. At any point, did you have to do that? Was there any moments you were like, uh, does this go left or right? Yeah, I, no, I, I, that's the, I always knew it was left or right. Right, um, yeah. But I think you do meerkat anyway, just because <laughs> you're attempting to see through a corner that you can't see through. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, luckily, luckily, I knew I did know where I was. Or I, did, I didn't want to go over there and not know where I was gonna, where I was going. I don't know how the guys used to do it when they used to set off and not know. You know, when the newcomers of old, when they had no, no training and no videos, just, just to, turn up, yeah, and ride just turn up and ride around, oh, not yeah. know where you're going. That's so difficult. You know, what was the toughest 
section or sector for you? I found the, the mountain. I think because there's less reference points and it's so open. I always felt like I could be going a lot faster than I was. And it was, I found it a little, a little bit frustrating because I was disappointed in myself because I thought I could go faster. And I think it's just because of the the lack of reference points. But I I loved it. You know, I love Mountain Mile and Veranda and um, coming down when you're coming back down Windy Corner and all of that. I loved all of that all of it but I always felt like I should be going faster I think because it is so open it kind of makes you feel like you can be going faster yeah, yeah. Mm. it's weird isn't it how different riders have f- favourite areas and, and learn particular sectors much easier than others you know and for no real reason it's quite yeah. a few people that have said that though about the mountain and that's right if yeah. you look at it in my eyes it should be easier to learn because it doesn't really look like anything else around the track but, 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 it's, but you it's found much it faster. Easier. It's much faster. Well, I suppose as well. so. Yeah. It's, it's obviously very high speed. You know, uh, some fast approaches and yeah. 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 yeah I suppose so. That's yeah. my favourite part, really. Well, kind of. I suppose uh, from Ramsey to the finish line, I was more at ease with. So you could just let it flow, and I didn't have to worry about that section particularly. Um, where there's other areas where I wasn't quite sure and a little bit probably apprehensive, and yeah, so. Is that because you felt like you could risk take a few more risks on the mountain because it was a bit more open and there wasn't the furniture you get in the villages? I think, the, the really, it, I don't mind the high speed. I love high speed, you know, um, but it's more the case of it's smooth. From, right. From Ramsey through to the finish line, pretty much it's very smooth compared to Ginger Hill to Ramsey yeah. or even from, you know, not not so many blind spots like there is from, from, from on the first two sectors, you know. Yeah. yeah. Nice. So uh, what aspirations did we have coming to the TT? Was it just to get around at that point? And yeah. did, you, did you have like a, a long-term vision of where you wanted to go with it? No, I just wanted to... To um, race it. To ra- just to race it and be part of it and to, to, to have done it and get round and make a good account of myself, you know, not be, not be awful. And, mm-hmm. and, just, and, and obviously everyone that goes over there, I think you have to do it and go... Is this for me or is this not for me? And it was totally for me straight away. But, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, you you can't go there. I guess because you might not, it might you might not gel. So if you go there thinking I'm I'm going to win, and then you go actually this isn't for me. I don't know. So it, it's just a case of being. I wanted to be safe, enjoy it, have the experience of being allowed to be a hooligan on a road. And so there yeah. was never a thought of being uh, desperately trying to be the fastest female around the TT course. No. <laughs> Definitely not. I didn't even. I Do you believe her? No. No, no I, wasn't, I wasn't really even aware of that. And because I was racing in British Championship with guys, I, I saw myself as one of the guys. So I never yeah. really. That wasn't even on my radar. So it was just a case of doing the best I could do for me over there. Yeah. yeah. Do many riders, I suppose you don't hear of them, but do many riders come across and go, this is not for me? They go, well, I want to do this, I want to do this. Then Mostly they set off and go, oh, God, no, not a chance. Uh, yeah, there's a few. Is there? Yeah, over the years. You yeah. Know, uh, not not that many, and certainly not many that would admit to it. Yeah. But, um, I think the two big names that I know of, one was John Reynolds, who right. was in, an incredibly fast you know, Grand Prix rider, World Superbike, British champion, and multiple British champion. Um, but for him, it was he very quickly realised it wasn't for him and just pulled out and stopped. Um, right, and also um, Dietrich, who was French champion, super champion, mm-hmm. he came over. He went straight on at the end of Sulby, straight into the field, no injuries, just straight on into a open gate into the field, and that was it. It was on his way home. Yeah, but it takes a braver person to admit that and to face up to the next and walk away. Yeah, than it does to compete on the course in a dangerous way if you're not happy with what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. but again, I suppose at uh, uh, the first year of going there, it's always going to feel like you, you're out of your depth, right? It's even though you love it, surely you must feel like this is this is a huge challenge to 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 get around to finish a race. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't feel like I didn't feel out out my depth. No. I think because as a racer, you're just trying to improve all the time, so you mm-hmm. never you never feel the, a negative way. You always feel in a positive way because there's always improvements to make, and you're always thinking yeah. about how I can go better and how I can go faster and what can I do to the bike to help. And yeah, you're always thinking about it in a positive way, so. Yeah, I mean, it's, obviously, it's a huge, it's a huge thing, and it's, I don't, know, it's, it's a, it's a great challenge, you know. It's a very mental challenge, you know, to, to concentrate and then to figure out how much you're willing to risk going around the corner that you can't see the exit point, yeah. you know, and, and committing to things. It's just, again, as a racer, I think it's nice having you want to challenge yourself, you know, you you like you thrive off those 
challenges and how and pushing yourself to see how brave you'll be. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and the TT gives you all of that, you know. That was it. The, the bug had been well absolutely. and truly got, and yeah. you were you were ready to to go back the following year. Yeah, I loved it. It's, it's, and just the whole island, you know, that it was bigger and better than I ever thought it would be. You know, I had yeah. a I had a, a thought of what you know. I went in two thousand as pit crew to Bill Smith, so I had a taste of it then. But to be part of it and to experience it, and the whole island's just great. You know, the whole atmosphere and everybody's on a bike it's not just you and racing everyone over there's on a bike yeah. you know there's bikes everywhere and everyone's loving it and i think the fact as well if you if you win a tt or you finish last you get massive amount of respect because you've you've oh, done it hugely, and just, yeah yeah just the whole it's so great I, when i came away from that i was like wow i'd never appreciated how great an experience it would be and how such a fantastic atmosphere the whole whole event is you know yeah what, what was your scariest moment around tt um i didn't i can't actually remember when i've thought about that and i can't actually remember Remember one? That's um, good. Even I did. To be fair, I did crash at the end of the straight, but yeah. I wasn't scared about that. Because <laughs> <laughs> you got it wrong, or what? What happened? Yeah, there? I just. To be fair, it's one of those moments where I probably could have made it, but I decided in my head I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but on a short circuit, you would have committed. You'd have been like, oh, nobody's fine. ever thought that. Before. Yeah, oh, I can make this. <laughs> <laughs> but I just I, I broke later at the end of Sylvie Straight, and then thought, oh, I'm not going to make that. But luckily for me, I landed. There was two options. There was off. You go over a bit of a dip actually into a field. Well, there is actually an open gate, um, and I chose the big massive hawthorn bush in the middle. But it was like a trampoline. I literally just went, <laughs> <laughs> bounced a little bit, and then got back up. And I, all I only broke the screen on the bike, and it was. You carried on. Yeah. Well, I didn't carry on. I went back, you know, ne- yeah, for the next yeah, day. Yeah. But yeah, if you're going to crash anywhere, it's quite a good place to crash. Yeah. Place to do it. Yeah. So you left in 2009. Were you happy with how you how your TT went? Yeah. Obviously, I, I did break the female lap record thing, so that was a big. Thing. Mm-hmm. I got to go in the press conference when the, the guys had won second and third, and there's me sat in there like, hello. hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was I'd I'd over sort of overachieved what I imagined, and yeah, really, really happy. You know, I'm not I'd I'd only done one year on um, a super sport bike. I'd never ridden ridden a thousand before, and I didn't really know how to ride that. So I was happy with what I'd done. I, I was in in the point again where I wasn't too sure how far how hard I could push a thousand. So. Mm-hmm. To, I was over the moon with what I did and I only took a thousand because Paul Phillips said if you're going to come over you might as well do as many laps as you can and yeah. don't just bring the 600 bring a thousand as well so I did the 600 races and the all the thousand races on my, on a super stocker so a thousand cc around there man it's still it's still it's still I, don't, I, I can't compute it well. it's so hard to they're just so hard to for a mere mortal like me they're so hard to ride at a track, let alone on a road. Just hang on, <laughs> just, hang, just hang on. As so easy what, as that. What? What else have you got? What else do you ride? Trials, motocross, enduro. Uh, yeah. what, what? I was just showing you before, wasn't I? I've got what? a bit of a collection of. Yeah, just t- tell the listeners what you know. What you get up to? Obviously, you know. Are you any good off road? No, I know, I know you do a bit of, <laughs> on the ovals, a bit, a bit up at Buxton. Yeah, at, a bit uh, of flat tracking. Andy Collins. And, I love flat tracking. It's great, yeah, great fun. So I got a uh, flat tracker. Absolutely love that. Just that's one of the best things to do ever. Um, enduro bike, a little bit of enduro in. I'm, I'm really not very good. I'm pretty awful, <laughs> but I love it. And then trials, a little bit of trials. I'm pretty awful at that as well, but I love it. <laughs> and then, yeah, I've got, over the years, I've sort of collected. I saw, I saw you showed me a picture of your workshop, of uh, of your bikes, and, you, and, you, and you've got a supermoto in there. Yeah, it's a boy. Do you do any racing? I didn't race, no. I did a practice day at Three Sisters. Do you fancy good. doing... Um, there's a round at no, in November at uh, Cabell Park. Cool. Do, you fancy, <laughs> do you fancy entering that? Because I, I know somebody that's going to be <laughs> racing there. That's all. Cool. Hopefully, I'm going to do it, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, and you yeah, could brilliant. have another scalp. You've already done one in this room. <laughs> you could... You could uh, I have to, hey, uh, you listen, could I've, taken some, I've taken some scalps. <laughs> I think I beat Dave Jeffries. Get out. Yeah. My, fir- my first race. Definitely beat James Ellison. Beat him into third place. I made the podium. He didn't. Oh, he's getting all serious now. He's getting all competitive <laughs> on come you on, now. Come on, I'll take you on any day. Come on. In fact, you come on, Steve. No. Yeah, you've got to do it as well. You've yeah. No, no, no. I don't do anything competitive anymore. So I've retired. Bullshit. That well, competitive edge is still in you. No, it's not. You must get it somewhere. No. Really? No. It doesn't bother me anymore, no. The only thing... I don't believe you. The only place I ride... In a competitive nature, is Goodwood Revival, but for that, I just enjoyed the event. And I'm not worried about winning. All right, 
Obviously, he won it a couple of years ago, but I, I, it's bizarre that. that no, honestly, that I'm you not. Can just be, switched off. Yeah, it? but you can be that competitive when you talk about it. You can see how competitive you were mm. to then just go. Oh, but not now, right. not in the slightest. Of, mm. Oh, I don't know. If someone said, "There's a bike, Chris, and there's a finish line," I'd go. I'd still go and try and beat everyone. No. Whether I could or I couldn't, I'd have a. I'd go and have a go. No. Right, I'm me and Jenny are going supermoto racing. My money's on Jenny. So is mine. <laughs> my, my, my money's not on me. <laughs> Although Jenny's been practicing wheelies, so I heard the, when we came in for the TT preview, you said you've been practicing your wheelies. I've been practicing mine. Mine are terrible. Really, really. I'm shit at it. Let's move on to Hollywood. Stunting. How tough is it? How tough is it? The stunt game. You know, you've you, you've you've been a stunt rider on various films. You know, high profile films. Um, but how tough is that? Do you have to do any crashing? Do you have to do? Is it very dangerous? What what kind of things do you have to do? Um, it, it's not. It's all very very planned. Um, obviously, you you were with me. We were both on Mission Impossible Five together. Um, you saw the the amount of preparation that goes into it. You know, it's very structured. They have a complete plan of what they want to see on camera. So, I guess in terms of that, it's it's not. It it can be dangerous if it goes wrong, but it's planned to not be dangerous. It's planned to be safe. Um, yeah. And it's it's only difficult because you've got a lot of people watching you at that point, and you you want to get it right. <laughs> you, you can't know. screw up. Yeah, and when they're actually filming, obviously they've only got a location for a certain amount of time, so everything's got to be done kind of to schedule. So you you've got to get it right the best you can straight away. Um, that that's the only I guess that's the only side. There's a lot of pressure on on you to do do your job. Um, and yeah, I haven't had to do. A, oh, I've had to do one crash so far, but I'm well up for doing a crash. <laughs> so it's like we need you to crash on purpose. So talk us through it. This crash. Yeah. What did you have to do? Uh, I literally, I only had to, I only had to skid a uh, skid a bike, uh, drop it, and then the like the hero character sort of jumps over the bike and runs off to yeah. save the day, sort of thing. It was only a little one, but um, but to fall off to crash a bike and make it look like you you weren't supposed to crash a bike and. And not try and protect yourself must be a difficult thing. No? I, I don't or did know. you just go slam on the brake? Just what? I'm letting go. Um, I think I think the good side of being a motorbike racer is you've crashed quite a lot in your career. <laughs> seen that to crash? Yeah, yeah, I guess you so. You kind of seen. I think you don't. Have any, I don't fundamentally have any fear of that. So, I, but and you, you know and, you're going to crash. That's the thing. It, yeah. On a motorbike race, you don't know you're going to crash until you crash, right? Yeah. But with this, thing, you're setting off knowing that you're going to have to crash and make it look convincing. Yeah, so there was a really good crash that um, Rick English had to do, unmonumentally great stuntman, mm-hmm. um, good bike rider, good car driver, fighter. Ev- he, pretty much every film you've ever seen, he's somewhere along the line, he would have been a stuntman, isn't it? He and, a, ha- and a good lad. Yeah, yeah. L- brilliant. Um, he had to do a high side, he had to instigate an actual high side and high side himself. So that, at that point, that's when... I, can, I think I could do a normal crash, but getting your mind over... Giving you making yourself do a high side is mentally got to be quite quite hard because when you bike racing, you don't want to high side, do you? That's so, the last thing you want to do, right? Yeah. Well, the first half of it doesn't hurt on the way up, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, trying to have a high side, but that you know that's gonna hurt, isn't it? No matter what, so, oh, flipping it, yeah, yeah. What, um, how are you, I, 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 sorry, how. Are you going to high side a bike? Because you're not going to be able to wear racing leathers either. Like, so how do they protect him in that situation? So he did have leathers, leathers on. But it, it didn't. Did it look like he had leathers on? There was the character kind of like, like in a suit or something else? Or um, it was just like street leather. So right. Um, just a jacket and trousers, not a one piece. Yeah. With an airbag suit. <laughs> That's still scary. That. Yeah, he did have a lot, a lot of body armor and everything. But um, Rick's unbelievable. Yeah, you know, he will send himself <laughs> yeah. if there's some great pictures of him high side and because he had to do it right behind tom cruise on key when tom just looks over at him he, and he's in the air you know he's on the poster for the film um and there's he's got some fantastic videos of him where he's sent himself into the back of a um a van where he's had to throw a suitcase through the window and he just literally drives and smashes himself into the back of the van you know stunt, these stunt guys that they earn the money yeah they earn the money you know they and they commit and they do a damn good job, you know. They're so underrated and so undervalued, I think, with what they do. How much would you need paying to high side a motorbike? Hey, it's good money. No, but I'm asking you, what what what's your price to high side a motorbike? I've um if I said it's fifty grand. I've experienced far more high sides than 
uh, and crashes than Rick English. <laughs> uh, and there's no money you can pay me. To, to go through it, I know. that's To, my, to will yeah. me on to go and do it for more money. Yeah. yeah. Especially, and you can't all, how easy is it, how easy is it to instigate a high side it's and a, make it look good? Because if that one doesn't, if that take doesn't look good, you've got to go back and do it again. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, any crash, really, yeah. or any scene to a certain degree, yeah. But especially yeah. high side, though. Would you do that? Would you do it, Jenny? If he said, come I think on. think I'd have a go. <laughs> I'd have a go. <laughs> Not a chance. No. I've done it numerous occasions, not meaning to. Yeah, so. yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but again, that takes you by surprise and there's nothing you can do about that. But yeah. like someone's going, right, come on, we need you to give it a, a massive handful of beans and but spit yeah, yourself Rick, off. Rick did it the other way, he did it on the back break. So um, he, couldn't, he right. couldn't, in that position, he couldn't do it on throttle because he would have rode into the back of Tom. Right. Because he's on, on his bike. So yeah. he, he did it on the back break. So he did a massive skid on the back break, released the back break <laughs> when he was at 90 and just fi- fired himself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Amazing. So what's the stunt world like compared to the, the racing paddock? It's fantastic. I feel really, really privileged to have been part of it. So name, name the films way. as well. Name the films you've been in. So obviously me and Steve, initially we were on Mission Impossible 5. So, so St- Steve was Tom Cruise's body double in absolutely. that though, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I'm taller. <laughs> <laughs> That's then, cool. Um, I was so lucky with that because I got to double the lead female character so I got to do a lot of work I think Steve did a lot of standing around didn't you really oh, flipping it, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I felt super lucky I got that I got chucked in the deep end of doing quite a lot of riding um and again that came from the TT to be fair so they needed a rider that could ride a mountain course so it was because it was at Atlas Mountains and it was on a, a mountain road with a sheer drop the other side over the wall so it was and it was on a sports bike it mm-hmm. was that, it was that kind of riding they wanted so um because of the TT, you know, I think I got, I got put forward for that. Um, and then from Mission Five with Wade Eastwood, the stunt coordinator, he he brought me on to Mission Impossible Six, and again I got to double the lead. So I did quite a lot on Triumph Tiger, riding that nice. all through um, Paris. Did yeah, loads of things on that. It was great fun. Got to ride down some stairs off an overpass and skid it around, and just generally have fun on a bike. Quite daunting though, because I was very much um, working with Tom. So. I remember Mission 5, there was a point where I had to get, basically just get off the bike. I had to get well, get on the bike, put the side stand up a certain way, get on the bike a certain side, and then put stare at Tom Cruise in his eyes. And that was, that was the hardest bit. I was like, oh. <laughs> I wanted to look away. <laughs> Jenny, there's still loads we want to talk about, especially when it comes to Hollywood, but we're going to have to wrap this one and we'll end it with Steve's quick fire questions. Go, Steve. Right. One or the other, no explanations. Okay. Quick fire, ten questions. Wine or beer? Beer. Two stroke or four stroke? Two stroke. Good girl. Romantic spa weekend or weekend riding bikes? <laughs> weekend riding bikes. Pineapple or never pineapple and pizza? Pineapple. Mass start or time trial? Uh, mass start. Tom Cruise or Valentino Rossi? Oof. Valentino Rossi. <laughs> <laughs> Grandstand to Union Mills? Or the Mountain Mile? Grand Santa Union Mills. Peter Hickman or Michael Dunlop? Oh, can I say both? No. <laughs> I like both. Can I I'm just going to say... Uh, Peter. BSB win or a TT win? Ooh. TT win. Last one. Maria Costella or Anna... Carrasco. Anna Carrasco. Lovely. Thanks, Jen. Jenny, we'll get you back on because there's still so much to talk about. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Steve, Jenny's just left. Um, I, f- I felt we, we, we kind of rushed towards the end a little bit. I was just going to say, we Due needed more fire, time. When, yeah, but when the fire alarm goes off in the uh, in the, build, <laughs> in the building, you can't quite hang around and carry on chatting. But, yeah, fascinating chat. And and again, like, the the little stories that you hear from Hollywood, that is, uh, it's quite a fascinating industry to be in, isn't it? And you can't really express how timid and shy Jenny is uh, and how she kind of uh, gets rid of that. As soon as she closes the visor and gets on any circuit or course. Two completely different people. Amazing. Yeah, what a great girl. And we'll, uh, we'll certainly have her back because she'll be out at the TT, I'm sure, doing some, some more radio for 2024. That's it for this episode of the TT Podcast. If you've enjoyed it, 
Obviously, you can't leave a review on TT Plus, so why don't you get your phone out right now and wherever you listen to your podcast, whether that be iTunes, Spotify, or any other podcast feed, leave us a rating and a review. I'd normally say at this point, me and Steve will be back. However, the next set of recordings are going to be done on the on the island at the Mike's GP. And unfortunately, <laughs> Steve's not joining me. Too busy. <sighs> what are you doing? I'm burnt out with you. You really have had enough, haven't you? No, I'm joking. Now I'm on other duties, obviously, yeah. with my Synetic BMW team, so I'll be elsewhere. However, hasta la vista. Rest assured, Steve, will be back. Make sure, wherever you're listening or watching these podcasts, that you enjoy it and you're back for next week's episode. See you then. Mm-hmm.